All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Winter in Chicago. This is ridiculous. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of meeting with Gwenda Joyce, and Gwenda is in Northern California, but she used to be in Chicago. She is now um, an artist coach and mentor and works with an array of artists. You know, maybe it's a surprise to some of you, but I'm not the only person who does this artist mentoring thing. There are others. And Gwenda is one of those that I respect her ability and her talent. I think all of us have different abilities and affinities and expertise. Um, there's some things that she's particularly good at that I want to cover tonight. Hi, Gwenda. Welcome. Hi, Paul. Thank you. And hello, everyone. All right. Glad you're here. Hi, Denise. Um, Denise is joining us from Brazil. We've got people from India and all over the rest of the planet. It's pretty cool. So, Glenda, you, you used to have, you used to be, you used to write, you used to be involved in, had a gallery in Chicago. You're in Northern California. In a nutshell, can you describe, you know, like in a minute, I don't want to go into long detail, about the kind of work you do and what you emphasize? Sure. Um, I'm glad to. I emphasize uh, working with artists one on one to develop. Uh, your art careers to help establish and expand your careers. And what I do is I help specifically help artists take decisive action and get their greatest work out into the world. Okay, great. Yeah, this is a complex issue, but that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, right. You know, one of the things we talk about in this course, and Gwenda just gave you a good example, is, you know, the elevator pitch or, the, you know, the short one-sentence description of what it is you do. And I would think that it would be good for all of you to have something like what she just said. So, you know, you've spent a lot of time in your life writing and you're particularly attuned to words and the spoken word and content and meaning. Um, with that in mind, what do you think, what do you see in a lot of the artists you work with that they could be doing better? Well, I, I think that, uh, Thinking and planning in general about your your art career is really the best thing that you can do because it's a complex issue and it's a complex world these days. So uh, first of all, I think you, as an artist, you really want to think about who you are and what kind of art you make and how you want it to get out into the world. And these are all things that need to be thought about before you actually start meeting with the public because I think it's, it's really essential to get clear. And if you're clear, for example, on who you are and what your purpose is with your art, then everything else kind of falls in place. Um, I'll, I'll give you an uh, example. I walked into a studio of an artist I work with. Um, when we started working together, and I, I looked around, and I knew this artist was really, had been working in encaustic for many years. She started working in encaustic before Jasper Johns did in the 60s, when encaustic started to be, to come uh, into vogue again as a medium. And I walked into her studio, and she had little uh, pieces of art of different sizes, and there was no thematic approach. And I said, Roberta, what, I'm confused. What are you doing here? And she said, you know what her answer was? She said, well, you know what? I'm not surprised to hear you say that because I'm confused too. And it kind of starts there, Paul, I think. Uh, so, all right. Um, what do you think an artist should do? How do they get past this confusion? I mean, I've come to the, I, I've come to the place where I didn't used to, but I don't think that an, I think an artist can work in several directions at once. You know, and I think the core is the the soul, the conscience, the vision of the artist, and maybe you know, hopefully, there's a thread that connects it all. Frequently, the artist is too okay. invested in each of these different things and sees them as being really different. But someone who's more neutral or objective looks at it and says, yeah, I see how all this relates. I mean, it doesn't look like Andrew Wyatt. It doesn't look like Lichtenstein. I can see how, you know, I can see continuity in what you're doing. But what did it, how do you work with that? What did you say to this person, Roberta, about her, all these disparate directions? Well, I really started with, with the questions of, 
of what is what's on her mind these days and what what is she thinking about and um she she did think for a moment and then she said you know every day when i walk into the studio i pass through this beautiful this tree out at my door and i pick up the leaves and i look at them and i'm just really interested in in including them in my artwork and so we we kind of started from there and it was the it was the idea that was important. And I think with art, it's always the idea that's important. Many artists say, oh, well, you know, I'm all over the place. I work in painting. I sometimes make sculpture. I have different materials. And I think that's fine. Uh, it, it may be a little harder to pull together. But if there's a cohesive core idea or message or some something that you want to say or uh, an approach that you have that takes all these different forms, that's fine. But what's important is to have that essential element. So with, with Roberta, we, we talked about the ideas and what ideas she wanted to express. And all of a sudden, this idea about the leaves and the trees that she was walking through so it started to become so much a part of her story and her environment. She spent time in uh, Northern California and also in England, where the same catalpa tree is located, and it, it became the visual metaphor for a lot of experience for her, and she ended up developing a big body of work around this, submitting it for a show, getting the show very quickly, and then getting into a gallery very soon after that. So, so it's a good, great example of how your idea directs your work and how it becomes the essential core idea of yourself and it starts taking form and then gets out into the world. Cool. One of the things that I think you're particularly good at is helping artists speak about their artwork. And that, you know, frequently, I mean, it's clear that artists are visual people and that, you know, if they were meant to be writers, maybe they wouldn't be so visual, et cetera, and that it's a different kind of a strength. So, but I, I, you work with artists in helping them vocalize, verbalize, be able to discuss what's going on in their art, right? I do. I do. All right. I, think, I, I appreciate that question because I think that's uh, very important in a whole process of getting your work out. And I have a, I have a, simple strategy, kind of the basic strategy. Let me interrupt you for a second, please. Hold on a second. Because as a preface to that, I mean, I think it's, you know, it really important for artists to generate relationships and to nurture their relationships and to grow their community, by which I, you know, which to me means a lot in growing karma and investing in other people so that they want to come back and invest in you and facilitate your process. And to be able to do that, what Gwenda's talking about, I think you need to be able to speak about your art intelligently, coherently, passionately, so that somebody else picks up on that and they can better understand how to serve you. Okay, go ahead. That's exactly it. I mean, you covered a number of things that I think are important. Uh, one is developing relationships, and I have a, a strategy I call turning contact into clients, and okay. that basically means that you can you can start a conversation or with anyone. Anyone can be a contact. It can be someone who uh, you meet at a gallery opening, or someone who you know from uh, common interests that you have common activities, or it can be someone you meet in the line at Starbucks. Uh, any way you make contact with people these days, there's a potential there for developing a relationship and having that person become a client. But it has to start with knowing how to get the conversation going. And knowing what to say is really critical. Oftentimes you meet someone and they find out you're an artist and then they go, oh, cool, you know, what kind of art do you make? And having an answer to that question very simply in a conversational way, uh, somehow when you can answer in say two or three sentences what your what kind of art you make in a way that draws people in, 
then you start the conversation, and the conversation can go anywhere. Uh, All right, so let's say you're, you're an artist, and let's say someone says to you, hi, um, oh, you're an artist? What kind of art do you make? What, what, what do you say? How do you construct that? Do you say, I make big paintings? Do you say, I make sculpture? Do you say, I work in, um, in plastic? What, uh, what? Where do you go with this? Well, there are four things that I think are important to include in this statement. And the first one is to, indeed, describe your art. You know, if it's a painting, say, I make paintings. If it's sculpture, say, you make sculpture. I mean, this is really basic, but describe it in a way that you're describing your medium and your material. And if okay. it has to do with color, you know, talk about brilliant color or, you know, natural materials. But give a sense, when you're describing, of, of what it looks like in the sense of uh, creating a picture out of it. And I know this is really basic, but I, you know, there, <laughs> it's so obvious to an artist, you might forget to say I make painting. Well, I think it's heartening to know that basic is okay, too. Basic is good. In this, in this situation, it's, it's really good. Okay. And then the second, second thing you want to do is think about what is your intention with your art? Like, do you, what are you intending your uh, effect to be on the public? You might be the kind of artist who is very political and has a really strong political statement. This is where you can, you can state that fact. Uh, you might say, oh, I just want it to be beautiful, and I'm really interested in creating something where people think about beauty. Um, whatever it is for you, this is where you put your intention in. This is important because it's where you're going to connect with people. And when you're in your intention, this is where you're going to find out if you have a commonality with someone. The third thing you want to do is, is move into the emotional realm. Like, how do you want people to feel? Do you want people to feel um, good about the world? Do you want them to like art? Do you want them to feel like um, this is where uh, life exists? in beauty and in art? Or what is it? What is the feeling that you want to put? If you make landscape paintings, you want to show how wonderful um, the light is at a certain time of day. These are the bring in the feeling element. And the reason you want to bring in the feeling element is that this is where people connect. We all connect, uh, find out whether we like something about a person at the feeling level. and you may not put this part into your artist statement, but this is where you want to put it into your conversation. And then when you have those three elements in, the fourth thing I like to say is, you know, after you've written it out and you're struggling with the words and you're wondering if you described it, think about adding a little poetry. And, and try and add some poetry to what you say that's kind of in relation to the kind of art you make. If you're very lyrical in your po in your work, be a little, a little bit lyrical with the statement. Um, if you're hard-edged, you know, you can be hard-edged. I know poetry isn't natural for a lot of artists, so try and think about that. Um, for example, take the phrase, a rose, from Gertrude Stein, a rose is a rose is a rose. I think everyone understands that Gertrude Stein took the metaphor, a rose is a rose is a rose, and turned it into something that now, you know, everyone knows that's Gertrude Stein speaking. So when a metaphor is when you take something like the word rose and you use the word is, you make it be something else. So add a little bit of that in the statement. And have fun with it. I think uh, people probably feel like, oh, you know, this is really serious. It is serious. It will help you get closer to the essence of who you are. But don't forget that this is all about uh, communicating the part of yourself 
that is the most essential, most, the most important part of you. And think of sharing it in a joyful way. All right, well, I've got two questions then. Um, is this something that the artist writes and memorizes to an extent and uses rote, or is this something that evolves and flows in line at Starbucks verbally? Well, I think both. You know, I think it's really important to prepare a statement and have it at the ready. And you differentiate this from an artist statement, right? This isn't an artist state. This isn't an artist statement per se, though it relates to it. No, this isn't an artist statement. I call it a short art statement. Some people call it a, it's kind of a variation on an elevated pitch. Um, but it, it can be extremely useful if you write it down and you get it to a point where you really like it, which means write it and rewrite it. You know, sleep on it, rewrite it, use it. Uh, but then, then I, I also think it's useful on on your website uh, as an introductory page. Agreed. But all right, let's go back to the verbal discussion. I mean, you don't want to take too much air out of the room by the other person says, hi, you're an artist, and then you go into a five-minute monologue. Um, you know, they might have paid for their coffee and be down the street by the time you're done. Exactly. So figure this is going to be two to three sentences, something that's under 25 seconds. And I think you brought up a really good point because answering a question um, uh, when people uh, start asking more about your art and then going into a monologue that ends up to be five or ten minutes long, it's not going to it's not going to engage people the way you want to. Put it simply, it's really going to turn people off to spend too much time talking in esoteric terms. And that's why I encourage using these these simple subjects, thoughts. This is not what this is not. Is it's not a description of your process. It's not a description of what you go through as an artist and all your various, you know, internal ruminations. So, to a large extent, you're assuming that the artist is speaking to a lay person who is trying, and you're trying to connect with them and to explain underpainting and overpainting and chiaroscuro or whatever is probably going to the person's going to lose it, and um, you want to deal with the more basic, the more tangible human emotions, um, and hopefully something that they can you can connect with them on a one-to-one -one human kind of level. Is that right? Well, exactly. And you know, Paul, I I work as an agent for artists, and I submit a lot of cover letters to various places, galleries, curators, art consultants. And I also use this statement in the cover letter. And if it's well written enough, concise and uh, clear and descriptive and interesting um, and thoughtful, then it really has a lot of different purposes. So sure, you want to use it with a lay person, but also you, you if it's intelligent, uh, you can use it uh, in your professional purposes as well. Okay. Now, you just said something interesting about working as an agent for artists. Yeah. Um, let's go into that. Define your terms first. What is an agent? Well, an agent is someone who represents someone else to something. Um, you know, in the music world, in the film world, um, agents are very common. But in the art world, there are very few agents. And I have started to take on this role with a small number of artists. Um, it's, it's something I really enjoy doing, and it's kind of an extension of what I used to do when I had a gallery, when I had time in the early years to represent and to you know expand and build the careers of the artists that I was representing. But nowadays, galleries don't have time or inclination to do that. Um, or less and less so. And so it's, it's up to the artists in many cases to be their own representative to build their careers. And I have started taking on this role for a few artists, and I, I really enjoy doing it. Is it prerequisite that you like or feel good about the artwork? Well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's the same as when I was a gallery owner. I just 
I couldn't represent an artist whose work I didn't believe in. It, was, it just it just didn't happen right. And the same thing is true. So when I work with artists, I do go through a process of, uh, you know, kind of an interviewing process to see if it's a good match. And, and actually, we do that in a coaching relationship as well to see if uh, I can, you know, what I, what I try to do is meet the artist where they're at. And, and we look closely at what, what the artist wants, where you want to go. And, uh, if it's a good match, then we end up working together. I suspect there's more to it, though. You also have to like a human being, don't you? Yes, yes. So, well, you have to. There's a mutual respect. Yes. Yeah, but so you have to like the art, and you have to like the individual. Yes. Anything else? Um, I have to. Well, I, I you know, I, I do an assessment. Probably everything I do is a combination of of uh, specific information and an intuitive sense, uh, but the, the information is that there, there needs to be a record of sales and of exhibitions. Um, the artist has to show a commitment and has to show, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a full-time artist, but it has to be a serious uh, artist with a serious vision and a serious sense of wanting to get their work out there and, and really develop and build a career. They have to be available to participate in the part in the process as well. Do, does the artwork have to be saleable per se? Uh, Maybe let me re-express that. Does the artist have to have a track record of sales? Um, actually, no. I mean, in most cases, yes. Yes, but there are a couple of artists I'm working with who don't work, who I believe the work is much more um, uh, mature than the sales record shows. And that's one of the reasons I think I can help. Is this always about sales, or are there other things that an agent or you as an agent do? There are other things that I do as well. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you know, I I, con I connect artists with curators, and that's an important part of developing your reputation. So, the, time know, out. These, this is back to the relationships thing, right? I assume these are individuals with whom you have an existing and ongoing relationship, the curators, et cetera, correct? Yes. Although mm -hmm. I I'm not opposed to meeting new curators and contacting them if I believe that they are interested in the type of work that my artist is is making. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's all about the connection and the relationship building behind the scenes. Do people? So you it's predominant. You're predominantly going. To, well, I don't know. Let me ask. Are you? Is it predominantly? Art dealers, art galleries, curators, are you going to art consultants? Is it public commissions? Are, uh, are these things involved in that or not? Or less like? They could be, but not as likely. Um, uh, I'm a little confused by the question. What I'm usually doing is, is submitting the work to galleries, art consultants, curators, you know, those kind, uh, kinds of things. Um, I may make suggestions of, of uh, projects or, or hear about exhibitions that the artist should submit to. I'll do that. It all has to do with career development. And so okay. I'm working with the artist to, to lead them in the direction that they want to go. So I'm doing the, the groundwork and like I'm the extra set of eyes and ears and the wall, art world connection for them. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure exactly if that's where you were going. No, I think that is where I was going. Um, I'm just trying to, now I'm thinking about the term agent. You know, we've spoken in this course a bit about an artist having a business manager. And I, I, I believe that, you know, until you're a highly successful artist, you know, you can't have a business manager who works solely for you because of the commitment and the prices could be too much. But, you know, this sounds a lot like, you know, being a business manager and working with an artist, and it may just depend on the semantics. Are you all, are you prone to tweaking their resume, helping them with the artist statement, or is that something that they should already 
You must do that too, if, if necessary, right? Yeah, I, oh, definitely I do that. And in fact, in coaching, which is often a relationship prior to the able relationship, uh, we work on the uh, we work on the statement. We work on the short art statement quite a bit. We really get clear on that because it brings in all the issues that we were talking about earlier, like you know your purpose and your mission for your art and, and your vision. So coaching goes through a lot of those things. And coaching also, um, I love the coaching relationship because it is, is very personal. And we really deal with the obstacle that the artist has or perceives to have in getting your career to grow, to develop. And these things are, are both complex and subtle and very individual. So so coaching will help kind of move through those to get really really clear about where you want to go and where your art is best suited to go. Because if you have a clear sense of where it's going to how it's best to be shown and presented in the world, then that line can be much greater. And everyone is happier if it's a straighter line. If you're if you're just trying every which way and trying all sorts of things and hitting roadblocks at every turn, it's very demoralizing and it's very frustrating and nobody likes to be rejected. So one of the goals is to minimize the rejection by doing the groundwork beforehand and getting clear and, and getting that path to be more clear and more accessible. So that the results turn out to be accomplished more quickly. Okay, here comes the loaded question. And you don't need to give specific numbers, but how do you charge for this service? Uh, well, I charge, I have kind of flat rates, and I'm just fee based, and I charge based on those rates. And I offer an initial consultation, sometimes two or three conversations before. Um, we get it going, but I, you know, you spend a little time figuring it out, um, and then it is fee-based, so if the artist can swing the fees, then we move forward. Okay. I know in this course, sometimes when artists do really well, I wish I was getting a percentage, but somehow it doesn't quite seem fair. It seems, you know, I mean, essentially this is fee-based. People pay for the course. And you know, and then they're then that's it. But they get all the record, oh, it's whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I you know, I think that's pro I think that's the right way to do it, despite what other temptations, you know, might be. Um, I also, I, I forgot to mention that I also do offer. You know, I mean, I, I request a ten percent commission on the first sale, if if that comes to pass. Um, but that's kind of the minor part, and I do that as a little bit of an incentive for me. But mostly it's fee-based, and most artists are very happy with the results. It just gets things moving so much faster than you could do yourself. Well, my sense is that, especially after listening to you know me listening to this course, is that there are so many things that artists could take on that you know um, it just can be overwhelming. And one of my adages is, is nothing is impossible for the person who has someone else to do it for them. Um, and, but, you know, and different artists have different strengths. Um, are there other services you perform as an agent, or is that pretty much it? Well, those are the two primary services. Um, I also do marketing. I will do marketing services. Um, which means the newsletter writing and helping to build a list for an artist. Um, but I, I have to say that coaching is very broad and expansive, um, and it will depend on what the artist needs uh, needs to focus on. Sometimes it's marketing. Sometimes it's all about building a list. Sometimes it's about thinking about your audience. When you say a list, define that. What do you mean? Uh, well, I think building a list is essential. No, what, what's the list? A list of what? A list of names of people who you want to keep in contact about your art and your career. And it's, a, it's an email list. 
uh, it comes from everything from Facebook to the name of the person that you talk to in the line at Starbucks. I was going to save this till later, but we might as well bring this up in this discussion. One of the questions that's been circulating in the last week I'm in dialogues in this course, people emailing and Facebooking, is how one grows a list and the proprietary, you know, the, the, is that the word I want, the properness um, of adding, let's say, oh, oh, Steve Jobs, I just found his email address. Probably not much value at the moment, but do I just add him to my list or do I, do I have to get his permission first, your opinion? I think uh, the most gracious way to do it is to ask people, and, and especially after you've had a conversation with them and say, I've really enjoyed talking with you. Um, I, I'd love to keep in touch with you. Is it okay if I add you to my email list and send you occasional announcements about what's going on with my art? Okay. And Let's say that you don't know the person, but you've heard about that, you know, Billy Bob, is a major collector who happens to really appreciate exactly what it is that I do. And I saw him, he was copied on an email I received, and there's his email address. Can I add him to my email list, or is that improper? Well, it, it, if you want, I'll go on, I'll, I will go on the stage, I will testify first as to what I think is, is okay. You may know me well enough to know what I think. But yeah. if you want to go first, you may. Up to you. Okay, well, I'll go first because I'm going to kind of go in, in the line of what is the um, acceptable, you know, way to do this in terms of the propriety of it. And um, it, what you want to do is have a CRM, which is a, some, some way to manage your email list. I use Constant Contact which I think is a great way to go. There are other things like MailChimp and AWeber. But having a system like that is really going to cut down your time and your energy and putting together your, your intermittent, you know, your, your, maybe your, your monthly newsletter or whatever it is, your quarterly newsletter. And anytime you add someone to that list, um, you know, you can always, you can always try. But, but generally what the CRM is going to do is send an email to a test email and request confirmation. So the person has to confirm. And if they confirm, then they're on your list. I mean, you, you know, the thing about the list calls, I and mean, you can put anyone's name on there and hopefully they'll open it and read it. It, it's considered to be a really good list if about 25% of your people open your emails. So, you know, you're, you're, the whole thing, you're taking a bit of a chance, but it's better than not contacting them at all, isn't it? How else are they going to find out about your work if you don't become proactive about um, making contact and finding ways to make contact and to follow up with people? I think that being proactive is the key here. You guys, the rule, the law, and I don't know if that the police are going to come hang you, hang, you know, knock on your door, but the law is that you need, the people added to your mailing list need to request to be on your mailing list, or they need to certify their interest in being on your mailing list. And if you use a service like uh, MailChimp and these other services that Gwenda's talking about, which I would agree with is advisable if you're sending to more than like 40 people, um, and it also generates a prettier email, you have to check some box in the process of adding somebody to the list that says, yes, you have permission to do this. That's the law. Now, I tended to teach my kids and feel the same way about this, is know the law, then do what you want. And if you're the kind of person who wants to follow the law, then you make sure you have the person's permission. If you feel like this is a little white lie and it's okay to add somebody without even having known them or specifically asked for their permission, then I think go ahead and do it. Um, I remember um, getting an email from a museum on a committee that I was on 
and it, it had put everybody else's names on the committee and a whole bunch of other people, they were carbon copied or they were copied, not blind copied. And it said, don't worry, we won't share your email address with anybody. And there were all the email addresses. And I immediately took all those names and added them to my email list. I have 10,000 names on my email list because I've grown it. You know, predominantly, I would say, in the manner that I just described. Certainly, a lot of people request to be on my list, but that's not the majority. So I think what you guys need to do is act in accord with your conscience and do what resonates for you. You know, you need, and this is really important, you need to give people the opportunity to opt out. You need to give them the option of unsubscribing and do it readily. You do not want to offend people. It's not much fun to get an email that says, you schmuck, how did you get my name? Why are you sending me this stuff? I'm calling the FBI. You know, the last part of that probably doesn't happen. But before I had a way for people to unsubscribe, I would get, you know, a handful of nasty emails periodically, and then I would have to go manually pull them out of the list. You know, then I went to a different kind of mail service, like Wenda's talking about, and they can unsubscribe by definition. That's my opinion. You know, as in this course, we bring in a lot of experts, and the idea is for you to hear different opinions, and then you can make up your own mind about, you know, what it is that you want to do. So, you know, I think that's that's the gist of that. Um, Gwanda, I want to open this up for questions momentarily, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that you want to talk about, what you do and or your perceptions about what artists' needs are that we have in touch that you might want to contribute about. Well, I would like to say that I think that in this day and age, there is a lot of competition and there is a lot on artists' plates. Uh, they have to do everything. Plus, you know, everything to build a career, plus, of course, make the art and figure out a way to support yourself. Um, I think that the more you reach out to get support for your art and think about getting support to build your career, there are options these days. There, you know, there are support systems at various levels, and I encourage you to do it. And, you know, I'm happy to do it. I'd like to invite you to join my free newsletter um, list called Thriving Artist Network. Um, Time out. Take a look in the chat box. Can you see the chat box underneath the picture of me since I'm talking and underneath the list of names? If you put your email address there, then people can write you, or you can put the URL there if you want, and then people can see that. Do you see that opportunity? No, I don't. Let me do this again. What does it say? It, it says chat. I just wrote the word hi. <laughs> chat. I see chat. Okay, and then there's it's a dialog box. Anything. Well, then I'll tell you what, why don't you just tell me what your website, what, what do you want me to put in there and I'll add it? Well, I've written a, a free report called Top Five Keys to Getting to uh, Becoming a Successful Artist. I give it away if you uh, register at thrivingartistnetwork.com. And it's a download. Time out, Thriving Artist Network. Go ahead. Thrivingartistnetwork.com. Okay. And if anyone is interested in um, registering for a free consultation with me to explore some coaching or agent opportunities, you can fill out a questionnaire at my website, artambassador.net slash questionnaire. And those are two easy ways to get in touch and stay in touch. And Emma, there's only one N in questionnaire? Two N's, actually. Okay, two, S good. Is in, two S is in an ambassador and two N is in questionnaire. Okay, good. I got it right. Um, okay, you guys, if you have questions, raise your hands. Glenda, um, it sounded like you predominant, you're in Northern California and you predominantly work with artists whose studios you can visit, which suggests an in-person relationship as opposed to internet or phone communication. Um, what's true? That's a great question, and thank you for it. Actually, no, I don't just work locally. My gallery was in Chicago. I know the art world. I travel extensively, and I work with artists all over. 
uh, some we work generally on the phone and Skype. Uh, and uh, sometimes I cannot visit the studio in person, but I do get out there and I'm in contact with galleries all over. I, I go to Hong Kong to Art Basel, Hong Kong, and, and I encourage artists also to reach out beyond your local region to make connections with galleries and curators and art consultants beyond your, your local region because there are many, many opportunities out there. Um, and you know, it requires reaching out. Do you, I see some questions. I want more hands up, you guys. Um, some people advise artists to find a gallery locally and then grow from that base. My opinion is, given the internet, that the whole world is your oyster and you can have a relationship with a gallery anywhere and grow in any direction that you want. What's your thought? I agree completely. I just, uh, started working with an artist uh, who I've actually known. I represented her very briefly in my gallery. And she has gone on, she lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. She has, uh, she's been showing in New York for about six years. She's just gotten a new show with a new gallery in, in Chicago. And she has uh, connected with a gallery in London. She had a show in London last year. And all of these galleries do very well for her. She sold, sold out her show in New York. But she cannot get herself a gallery in San Francisco to save her not life. And it, it, it's frustrating to her. But part of the reason is the way the galleries are oriented and the kinds of the things that they're showing and representing here, are just they just don't match with her. And who knows, there may be other reasons as well that don't come to light, but uh, it, it, uh, I encourage people to go beyond their local community or local cities. Sounds good. Yeah, Mary. And, yeah I was in uh, there's, a, there's a Hong Kong and London gallery that's representing a Bay Area artist as well, and he doesn't have a gallery in, in San Francisco. Now, I don't think you need to have a gallery in your hometown. I mean, it's nice to have your friends know that you're, you know, you're doing okay. And a local gallery accomplishes that. And it, it's, you have a bigger party that, at that opening than you went out of town. But I don't know that those are the objectives in making solid art. Hi, Marion. You got a question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Marion. Marion, this isn't working at all. Time out, time out. It's not, no. I, I just muted you. Marion, can you type your question and I will read it because it makes you sound like a three year old mouse and I know you're not. So, can you type your question? Does somebody else have one and then we'll come back to Marion's question? I'm sorry, Marion. Um, I don't see any other questions. Type quickly. Um, Does somebody else have a question that they would like to ask Gwenda? I don't see that. All right. Um, let me go back to Gwenda. What what stages in people's careers, Gwenda, do you are you working with? Does it matter? Or can they be in different stages? It doesn't really matter, but I'll tell you that I have ended up working mostly with artists who I would say were are more mature in age, maybe uh, mid-career and older. And the situation for most of the artists is that they feel like they are they have never gotten the attention or the representation that they deserve. And they're starting to recognize that maybe the timing, the time for um, really establishing a, a career will pass if they don't get on it and do something about it. They're starting to think about their legacies, perhaps. They're starting to recognize that um, their art is really important and they don't want to just have it sitting around. Uh, or leaving it to their their children who may not may or may not really care as much or understand it as much. So they're 
wanting to connect with the art world and see what they can do. And they're very highly motivated. And usually they're making, you know, really, really good art because they've been doing it for a long time. And I appreciate it because they're obviously committed. They've been making art for, in most cases, most of their lives. Maybe they've had other careers and now they have time to devote to uh, full-time art making. Uh, but those, those tend to be, I would say, about 80% of my clients. Okay, cool. Um, somebody had a, qu oh, a couple questions. Let's go to Tracy first. Go ahead, Tracy. I'm just curious, on the constant contacts and the emails, what typically goes into those from an artist? Well, you know, that's a great question, and, and, it, and it can be as simple or as complicated as you want. I, mean, I think most simply, you want to send out regular announcements of your shows, your forthcoming shows. I think also if you're a little bit more inclined and more ambitious, you can create a more, more newsworthy newsletter and send it out every month or two with some information about yourself and about the things that you're interested in, your subject matter or your subject or your life that really is about you, the artist. And if you're sending out a newsletter about you, the artist, you have broader appeal. And people will really get more connected to you. And I, I think that's a great strategy. I think so too. It's, you know, it's about relationships. I think the one thing I would advise is to not make it too long and to make your paragraphs short because this is the internet and people have short attention spans and if it's difficult to read, they'll stop. So I like to have my, I don't, I don't recommend paragraphs longer than three sentences, which isn't necessarily, you know, Funk and Wagnalls, but it, it, it or, oh, who's, who wrote, I can't remember, the guide to, um, but I'll find, figure it out later. So I think you wanna make it particularly readable unless you're a really brilliant writer um, and like that. Pictures too, and, and you you can include some a bit about your process. But basically, you know, if if you think about the kind of audience that's out there and who you're appealing to, um, you have a lot of competition. So you want to make it interesting, short, you know, dynamic. But you want to tell the high points about what's going on. People are most interested in. Um, Say if you say you made a big sale or you got your work included in a prestigious collection, that's newsworthy. You know, talk about you. You're going to be maybe feel uncomfortable talking up your your high points, but again, if you don't do it, then who is going to? And if you do it in a nice way and in a context uh, that is about your art and sharing of yourself and your art career, then I think people are happy to receive it. I think so too. I, here's a comment from someone who seems to be interested in working with you or considering that and they want to know about references. Are you comfortable having someone who might want to work with you contact people with whom you've worked? I, I do that on a private basis. I don't um, put it up on my website for for just a... Uh, but if somebody contacted you and said, Glenda, can I talk to a person or two who's worked with you? Um, can I have their phone number or email address? You would provide that? I will do that. Uh, you know, again, I suggest we have a consultation, a pri you know, just a, a private con conversation first, and then I can refer a person uh, to that person. I yeah, right. I, mean, lot, I, I also have a lot of testimonials on my website. All on the first. Yeah, no, I've noticed that. You have quite a few. There's there's some good stuff there too. If you have questions. I want to thank Alan for telling me it was Strunk and White, the guide that I was trying to think of, that I was right. blanking on. Thank you, Alan. I should have known that. You know, yeah, I, we both should have, but we didn't. Um, or, you know, we just were dealing with more important things at the moment. What about what about this, this conversation in Starbucks and somebody says, I'm an artist, and you say this, can you then pull out your um, iPad mini or your cell phone and say, hey, check out this image? Well, yeah, see, we didn't get to this, but I have like five steps in my basic best strategy that I suggest. And 
Um, I'll just run down the list for you here. Sorry, chair the five steps. I'm ready. Number one, know what to say. That's where your short art statement comes in. Know who to say it to. Like figure out right away, is this a person who is, you know, worth investing in and developing a relationship with, or is this is this person that I'm never going to see again? And there are some skills that, that go into identifying people's characters and the potential for developing relationships with them. So that, that's an important thing to know. So know who to say it to. And number three is have something to show. So have something to show. Have an image there. Have, have it on your iPad. Um, are on your phone. There is something called the Ultimate Artist Gallery .com You can go to the Flickr. You know, put put a notebook on and have it available because you never know when you're going to need it. And you're making visual art, so have a visual. Uh, number four is hold an event, and I think holding an event is a reason to invite people to something. So this is where your list needs to be in order so you hold an event anything from open studios to um, a gallery event or a, a benefit anywhere that that you want to get your people to come and see your work um, um, hold a face you know of course post it on Facebook do all that and number five is keep in touch so don't forget the follow up after your event is really important because by the time, if you keep in touch with people, by the time you have your next, next event, people are going to be more inclined to come and buy. And then you won't have to worry about all the sales techniques. It's just going to be much easier because you will have developed that relationship and you will have developed a comfort level with your potential clients and they'll become your, 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 your clients. I kind of like to feel like I'm talking to my next door neighbor which is probably someone who kind of wants to like me or get along, but they don't necessarily have, it's not like my brother or my mother or my wife, you know, where they have a really big vested interest, but you're trying to have the relationship grow, you know, so you're writing to someone that's kind of familiar, but, you know, it, it, to me it's sort of like that. Um, Rick, Beer Horse, go ahead, Rick. But what you might say about artists' website. What kind of things do you look for? Oh, they can't hear me. Um, I don't know. Well, let's see. I look for current work. I mean, I'm answering in the abstract. If I looked at a website, I could give you a, uh, some more clear feedback. But what I think is really important is to have a short statement, current work, and don't overwhelm your viewer with too much information. Websites are great, but I think the real issue these days is because everybody has a website, the issue is driving traffic to your website. How are you going to do that? And once you get someone there, you want to give them the most current information, a, a, a synopsis. If they want to spend time, they can dig deeper, but uh, keep them current. That's a hard thing to do, but keep them current. In terms of sending out emails, I think it's better to send out an email every two weeks that is short than one every four weeks that's too, that's too long. Hey, Rick, did that answer your question enough before I interrupted? Yeah, that's fine. Are you sure? <laughs> what else can I help with? What else would you like from me? Well, um, anything about selling through the website? Do you, have you seen um, models that are successful for that? Did you say selling? Selling, yeah. Okay. Commerce okay. through the website. I think it's a good idea these days to have a, a couple of pieces that are for sale. I would encourage them to be uh, lower price pieces, and you can keep them active by changing them. They could be seasonal. Uh, they could be a special something. I think it's unrealistic to think that somebody is really going to be purchasing a major work, you know, say $2,000 or more over the Internet without personal contact, although more and more of that is done these days. But I, I, would, I would say have it be a lower price piece 
and make it be available only for a short period of time. And you're putting the price on the website, right? Yes, and if you have a newsletter and you can drive traffic to your website for purchase, then you can you can kind of do a campaign. You do a seasonal campaign. Um, saying that, that you have a new release, you are making it available for a short period of time, tell a little story about what the piece is all about and why it's being released now, and make it available at a, at a certain price. It sounds yeah, like a I'm sorry, Rick, go ahead. No, I like that. I like that idea very much. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to move on. Um, Alan, go ahead. Um, hi, thanks. Uh, I just I love what you were saying, and um, Gwenda, and I love your questions, Paul. And it made me think of um, I was wondering, like with your services, Gwenda, do you? Um, and I know that it probably varies according to who you're working with. But would you say you work with if you're representing an artist, if you're the agent, you would do this for I don't know. Months, a few years. What is kind of the time frame? And then you're, are you are you getting a fee monthly or something for all this time? Can you give me a little better idea of how this structure is structured? Sure. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, generally, it's a monthly relationship, and uh, if we start with coaching, uh, it will generally go on for a number of months, usually three months minimum. And then it can move into uh, an agent relationship, and the agent relationship is a minimum of six months. And then it can also evolve into a longer term. Um, we kind of evaluate as we go along, but I really do like you to think in terms of it being long, long term or longer rather than just you know short. And the reason is that. Um, there's plenty of information that gets bypassed or passed along, but I feel that this is really more than information. This is about transformation. Right. Um, the goal is to transform you and your career into something long-term and sustainable. And, and truthfully, that just doesn't happen overnight. Right. I didn't think so. I just was wondering how you were yeah. thinking. No, right. great Thank question. you. Thank you. Wenda, in terms of sending out missives, do you feel like it, it should be every two weeks or it should be every time something interesting happens? And how interesting should it be? I mean, if I get a commission, I should, I should send out an email. If I sell a major work of art to a collector or to somebody, I should send out an email. If a museum is exhibiting one piece of mine, I should send out an email. What, you know, like, what what do you how often do you do it? How much do you include and what kinds of things at what point is it ridiculous? I bought new paint. Um, you know, like what do you cover? Well, um, you know, that's a really that's really an and I think it's a very individual answer because it um I send out my newsletter every two weeks. I started out every two weeks, and now I'm an intermittent one. I'm sending it out every week, and I do it like clockwork. I spend a lot of time on that. But I have a different kind of business, and I like to write. So I fully understand that artists are primarily <coughs> making art. They don't want to spend time focused on a newsletter. And in fact, if they're lucky, they can get it out four times a year. And so I would say at least get it out four times a year. Every quarter, you want to have something to say to your audience. Because they'll, honestly, they'll forget you. And you don't want them to forget you. You want them to remember you. And you want to keep them informed. If you can do it more often, and you have time to, and you're inclined to, great. Once a month is great if you have something to say. Um, I've worked with artists to come up with, I used to be, long ago I was a magazine editor and I kind of liked doing this. It was like putting together a whole year's worth of issues for me. And I worked with an artist to come up with stories for the whole year. And that's the kind of thing that we could put together. And in a way, it's a marketing plan where we have newsletters and then we have ways to drive traffic to your website. And we have ways to 
uh, connect to a social campaign on Facebook. So there, you know, there are a lot of things that, that can be done now with the technology. But again, you're an artist. If you don't have time to do it, it probably won't get done. But I encourage you to do it, and you'll get good results if you can spend some time and effort putting it together. I love that I've got artists participating from other continents. Vibhas, who has a bad cough, is asking me to ask this question of you. Okay. He says, to me, it, he's in India. To me, it seems like putting up art on the Internet is like trashing outer space with precious gems. Now, from what I gather about approaching most galleries out of context or randomly is that it seems to be off-putting for most. If the Internet is still the means through which the artist wishes to be discovered, then it all seems like a process of random scouting by these galleries balanced with maximum trashing of outer space such that it doesn't seem like showing off. Um, yeah, you're making me think of this movie I saw recently called Gravity, where there was all this debris out there in outer space, and our beautiful universe being messed up with all the, the junk and residue. Um, I, I don't quite see it that way. I, I see that um, the Internet is a wonderful communication medium, and a great way to connect information to people around the world. Um, but I, I still think you want to be careful. You don't want to put everything you've ever done up on your website. You want to edit it. You want to always only choose the best work and only show your best work. Um, galleries don't generally go out surfing the internet unless they're directed to it. So, and I think that's true with pretty much everybody, collectors and, and uh, curators alike. Uh, somehow you have to, there are so many websites out there and there are so many artists that somehow you need to direct them to it. And, and if you think of your website as being a place where somebody's been directed to, then you realize you have control over what you want to show them. And choose that wisely, I think. Choose that carefully. We, we, are, we are close to being out of time, uh, but we can keep going. Um, yeah, I think we've gone over. Yeah, that's okay. Um, Sean, let's ask you a question out loud. Sean, go ahead. Um, different, keeping different kinds of lists. Things I've read in different places have been like, oh, keep a list of your of like gallery contacts, keep a list of curators, and then keep your like general public list. And I was just wondering if that is just way too ridiculous compartmentalizing or if that's like a helpful strategy. Um, I think it's a really helpful strategy. And, and luckily, for example, I use constant contact and you can, you can segment each list. You can have a list of curators, you can have a list of collectors, you can have a list of uh, you know, people who purchased from you, and you can send out newsletters or make contact with those individual lists, and you can also combine them all very easily. It's really, it's just part of the system. It's really easy to do. Wonderful. It's a little extra work, but not that much. Cool. I don't see any more questions. Maybe we should call us a wrap, huh? Um, Uh-oh, John has a question. Well, this won't be short. Go ahead, John. Uh, Sorry. So, okay. uh, I, I kept getting disconnected, so I don't know if this has already been asked or not. Go for but, it. Um, sure. I, 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 have a, I just have problems talking about my art. It, it, it's, it's, I express right. myself in different ways, you know what I mean? And, and, it, and it's the – talk about the painting. The painting is – you know, you know what I mean? The painting is the painting. It's what I feel about it. So I always feel very – awkward talking about my art and is there anything you know other than like, i'm going to look into taking some of the you know is there like a because also i don't i don't feel like i speak art natively you know i mean everybody talks about i've studied i understand different artists and different modes and things but i don't know how to classify my own work does that make sense 
You're not alone, John. I know a lot of artists who are challenged that way, and it's, it's because your art is so close to you and it involves so many different things that I, you know, it's difficult to hone it down. Um, and I work with with a lot of artists on that. If, if you wanted to work on that individually, uh, part of coaching that that would definitely be some one of the issues we would come up right. with. Right. I have also, um, I did put together a downloadable video and an ebook that you can uh, read about on my website and you can purchase and, and it, it goes over the things that we were talking about tonight on the program, but in greater depth. Mm -hmm. and I think it's a really good tool. Uh, it usually just takes an hour or two to come up with your own statement. So you, you know, also, I mean, right. thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what I needed. You know, Sean, Sean wrote, I'm sorry, Sean wrote, practice, 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 practice. You know, and also, I've invited all you guys to follow Dawood Bay's guide for writing an artist statement and then send that to me for critique and, you know, development and my comments. So that, John, you're welcome to do that. You haven't done it yet. I'd be glad to, you know, take a look at it. You I know, did, I'm, I'm working on you. You sent one back to me, and I'm working on putting it again. And I'm going to resubmit. I'm going to work it with you still. So okay, beautiful. Yeah. Um. All right. I think we should be done. Let me see if I've got anything else here. No. All right. So Glenda, I think this has been really wonderful. I think you've provided a lot of information and helped keep people's eyes open and open their eyes. Um. Both. I think it's been really good. Thank you for joining us. Let me unmute everybody so that they can literally echo that. Thank you very much. Wanda. Thank you. Thank you. Wanda. Yeah. <laughs>